Hello. Good evening and welcome to the final in our series of interviews with library people. Um, on Monday, we talked to Chloe Tallock from Shetland Library. And last night, we heard from Dan Marshall from Sheffield. And tonight, we're going to be seeing the interview from Andy Linehan, who is with us tonight from the British Library's popular music collections. Hi, Andy. Hi, Helen. Hopefully, um, we'll have some questions throughout that Andy will be able to answer after the interview. Um, if you want to just put them into the Q&A, uh, we'll pick them up at the end. That's great. Um, we created this series of interviews because we wanted to remind everybody how amazing libraries are, um, that we're still here and still open and come, come. Um, after the event, we'll send out an email with a short feedback link, which would be great if you could complete. Um, and all of the interviews will be available on YouTube. Uh, we'll send a link out when they're ready. And I think now we'll watch Andy's video. Uh, I'm Andy Linhan and I'm curator of uh, popular music recordings at the British Library. I work in the sound archive of the library and uh, my task is to um, make sure that popular music from uh, the UK is represented in our collections. Excellent. So is that all popular music? It is. Uh, it, it's pretty much everything that's not classical or kind of world music. So it's everything from late 19th century musical and variety through Jazz, rock and roll, punk, funk, dub, um, dubstep, drill, grime, everything, really. And how, how does that happen? How does the um, collection get collected? The British Library is the National Library, and the National Library for um, many published uh, media, uh, the rule of uh, legal deposit applies. So if you publish something in the UK, you're legally obliged to send it to the British Library. So it's a book, newspaper, journal, magazine. You have to send a copy to the British Library. Um, that rule does not apply to sound recordings. So we rely on donations, um, largely from uh, record labels and increasingly from individuals who are kind of creating music. And so it's a, a voluntary donation scheme whereby people um, send us their releases and they join the national collection. Um, obviously over the last 25 years or so, the digital platform has risen and a lot of people are releasing material only digitally. So we had to find ways of covering that sort of material and uh, we're doing that quite successfully now um, and trying to roll it out even further. So uh, there's a lot of work like that sort of thing coming in, um, but also uh, you know, helping people who uh, want to find out about historical uh, types of music, events, uh, and pointing them to the collections, seeing where they can, can read about uh, a particular type of music, where they can hear documentaries or interviews, all of those things that we have here uh, to help people understand and get a picture of uh, popular music from any, any time, really, in, in the last 150 years. Wow. And, and how many um, staff are in, the, in your department? Uh, in the popular music department, there's me. Um, <laughs> so it's quite a big job. I mean, obviously, we do have other people. Um, we have uh, some cataloguers uh, and people who do the processing of um, incoming material. And I do have someone who works with me, um, uh, Jamie, who uh, his job title is Record uh, Label Liaison. So his job is to actually... Um, find people who are putting out records that we might not know about and contact them and say this is what we do um would you uh, be interested in, in in kind of donating your your releases to us you know here's perpetuity do you want it <laughs> uh, yeah that, that that's the that's the gift we offer is mm. um pop for posterity uh, i think was the way we look at it so you've got a physical collection and a digital collection um the physical collection must be massive uh it is. Uh, I think uh, last time someone tried to count, we had seven million sound recordings. Um, and they are, yeah, as I said, they do go back way back to the late um, 
1900s, uh, 1800s to uh, wax cylinders and all the kind of subsequent formats up to compact disc and digital files. So um, there's a lot there and it's, it's, uh, it's increasing all the time. So where, where are they? Uh, I, can't, I can't believe they're in your office. They're not all in my office. It does look like that sometimes, but um, they are stored. Most of them are stored in the basement uh, here at St Pancras. Uh, the British Library building here has got, um, I think, four basement levels, uh, which go kind of under the Euston Road, next to the Victoria line going past. As you can hear the tubes through the wall as you're down there picking records off shelves. And so we have um, a lot of material here. We do keep some material in uh, the British Library's northern outpost in uh, uh, Boston Spa uh, in West Yorkshire. But anything that's up there, I can retrieve within 24 hours. I just call it up and it gets sent down to me. So it's all pretty accessible um, if I need to get hold of something. Who would access I mean, if I just wanted to sort of know, you know, something about an, an artist from 30 years ago, would I just contact you? How, how does it work? Um, well, you can, we encourage people to do their own research. Um, and to do that, you get a, a British, British Library Reader's Pass, and that gives you access to the reading rooms. Um, that means you can then um, look at, for example, if you're looking for something 30 years ago, you'd probably look at the music press, back copies of magazines that don't exist anymore, like Melody Maker or Sounds, uh, New Musical Express. Uh, you could look at any books that have been written by people about that particular type of music or the actual featured artists. And you could listen to, uh, you have to make, um, to listen to sound recordings, generally you have to make an, an appointment in advance because we have to kind of make sure the copy of what you want to hear is um, audible and we, we generally digitize them and you listen to a digital copy. Um, but you can do that in the reading rooms if you've got a reader's pass. So um, it, it's there available for people uh, to use and we, we encourage people to come in and use it. And so we get all types of people using it who are maybe um, students uh, working on um, their theses or studying a particular type of music or people in the media, producing documentaries, radio programs, podcasts uh, might come in. Um, and also people sort of hear that their grandfather once made a record and they, they haven't got any trace of it. Can they try and find it? So all sorts of people come in and use it. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's um, we get a lot of visitors coming into the British Library anyway. Uh, and we try to make uh, our audio as accessible as possible. So we're starting to try and put listening posts around the library uh, so that members of the public can just kind of have a, have a taste of what's in our collections. And so we're, we're kind of um, encouraging people to look on, on sound recording as a, a, a kind of medium that you would use to study just as much as you would use the printed uh, material to find out about things. That sounds great. I, I love the idea of listening posts. It's, you know, it, it's good to just give people a, an, an example of, of, of the sort of things that we have in the collections. And I think that, you know, through that and our website, um, where we're about to launch a new website early next year, uh, which will be British Library Sounds. Um, there is one in existence at the moment, but we're upgrading it. And that is going to hold a huge number of um, sounds that are available for people to listen to uh, over the internet. We've had just had a, a big um, digitization project, project, which was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And we have digitized uh, hundreds of thousands of recordings, which will, once we get the copyright clearance, be on that website for people to be able to come in and listen to. The um, collections, are they do they have to be music that's published in the UK? Is it all British music? Uh, material published in the UK is what we look for. So it doesn't have to be, uh, the, you know, the artists aren't UK artists necessarily, but it's published in the UK is the starting point. But we do have a world and traditional music section. So obviously they have um, music coming from plenty of other places. I myself will acquire, um, you know, recordings by uh, UK uh, musicians that might be not released in the UK, but released in the USA or Spain, Portugal, wherever. Um, so we're not um, 
insular uh, in terms of our collections and uh, we like to kind of have representative samples of popular music from from around the world as far as we can um, and increasingly it is a global phenomenon that the, the kind of the artificial barriers of having to kind of um, shift physical items from one territory to another um, are, are, are disappearing and so um, you know it, it is you know a global a global phenomenon but um, we concentrate on UK uh, material. So thinking about resources if you had an unlimited budget what would you how would you like to spend it? Uh, I would be surrounded with people right now. Um, <laughs> I would have a team of people uh, who would be out looking for material that we haven't got. Um, one of the things uh, we're constantly doing is seeing whether we are covering uh, particular types of music enough, whether we're, you know, particular periods where we might not have been getting releases from certain record labels. And so there's a constant kind of reviewing of what we've got in our collections. Um, and so I think we would like to have, you know, to have a resource whereby we could do an absolutely uh, comprehensive um, review and go out and purchase or obtain the recordings that we're missing uh, would be very good. Um, there are also a lot of rare recordings that uh, tend to go for a lot of money at auction these days, which um, are kind of as my day to day budget. And so, um, you know, but there are times when I can dip into British Library funds to, to, to buy them. But um, but yeah, I, I think resources really, and also to the ability to make things um, more accessible by digitizing pretty much all we've got. Um, that would be uh, an ideal. So as well as the uh, actually coming to the British Library and listening. Can you can you access material online? Can you sort of is there like an online portal? Um, yeah, it is something we we do have a, a website BL Sounds uh, that's operating at the moment, and our catalogue is available online, so you can see what we've got. Um, only a small proportion of what we have of seven million recordings is uh, available online at the moment, but um, with the new website. Uh, hopefully in February next year, um, uh, hundreds of thousands more will be available on there. And it's, you know, every year, um, new record, well, old recordings are newly becoming out of copyright. So we are able to digitize more and more. So we need a, a rolling program um, to keep up the, the, the rate of increase of uh, the number of sounds that we have on our websites. And that's something the library um, generally uh, is prioritizing at the moment is um, trying to, you know, because we, we are aware of the fact that we're a national library. We were primarily London based, but we have got the reading rooms in, in Boston Spa, but we serve the whole of the UK. And um, the way we can reach most of the UK most easily is through the digital platforms. And so the library is very, very keen on uh, a number of our digitization programs um, are in place just to ex increase accessibility to our collections where copyright laws allow us to. Is there a recording that you've come across and when you knew you were going to be able to um, acquire it, you, it just melted you? because it was so wonderful. <laughs> um, there's a few kind of rarities that we've got hold of that I'm quite pleased with, some kind of um, rare Beatles material, uh, some promotional copies of their first ever single where they spelt Paul McCartney's surname incorrectly on the label. They were that new. Um, that was good to manage to get hold of one of those. And it's things like um, we have someone just rung me up a few years ago and said, um, I've got a cassette you might be interested in. I used to go to school in Oxford and there was a band that used to play and I bought a cassette at one of their gigs and it was just a kind of homemade cassette the sort that bands would sell at gigs. And she said it's been in my knickers drawer for the last 30 years and uh, the band were called on a Friday and they changed their name to Radiohead 
Um, and uh, this was just donated to us, which was uh, brilliant, you know. Um, and uh, that sort of thing doesn't happen as often as you would like it to. So, and I guess you've got um, playing capacity for all formats. I have. Uh, you can't see right now, but just here, there's a, a turntable. I've got a CD player, a cassette player, and we have tape machines. Um, I've got all sorts of things around my desk, which including um, a wax cylinder, oh um, which uh, I don't have a player for that at my desk, but uh, this is what a wax cylinder looks like. Wow. Um, and uh, all sorts of, um, you know, I, I, I have things which I'm just uh, keep by my desk because I think uh, they're worth hearing or I've never heard of this person before and you see read things about them and you may want to kind of discover them so yeah i i, I do have equipment here but we have huge um uh technical facilities uh, at the back of the building and i have uh, and the team is audio engineers so i can take uh, say a, a quarter inch tape um and like this and i can go down there and lace it up onto a tape machine and listen to it down there. So we can play pretty much anything here. Um, and I can play quite a lot at my desk. So I do quite often uh, find myself, um, you know, if I'm trying to write something or if I'm um, something working on a, a particular project, um, I can listen to music at the same time, which is um, it's part of the job, really, uh, I suppose, but it, it's it, it's a good part of the job. Mm. So how does a wax cylinder actually work? <laughs> uh, you're probably better off asking one of our... Um, is it a, this a needle or...? Yes, uh, what it is, is you, you've probably seen the, the, the old um, cylinder players where they have a kind of a horn that tapers down uh, to a, a needle and people just shouted down the horn, the needle at the bottom would vibrate and it would cut a, uh, uh, a groove into the cylinder, uh, the vibrations, and then you reverse the process and the sound comes out. Wow. So that, that's the basic um, explanation of it. Um, not the most technical explanation, but uh, that's pretty much it. That's amazing. Um, any eight track cartridges? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> might even have one here. Um, yes, we have eight-track cartridges. We got formats that appeared and disappeared very quickly, like digital audio tape. Uh, this is one still in its wrapper, which is quite rare. Um, so things like that, mini disc, uh, VHS, Betamax, all of which um, you know uh, were at one stage very high-tech media, and are now in the past. And that, that's actually what our digitization project has been concentrating on: is getting the recordings from those media that we won't be able to play back much longer because the machines aren't made anymore and getting that into a digital format that we know is um, will have some uh, a good deal of a lot longevity do people um musicians um writers donate their is there a point where they kind of donate their life's work if you like or what life's work up till up until now um, yes, I mean, it, it is something that we, we that's a kind of, uh, I suppose, playing the long game where, where you talk to people who are in that position, people who are successful or influential, and you kind of talk to them about what, what are their plans. And you know, some people are very, very particular and careful about archiving their creative processes, others not so much. And so obviously what we try and do is encourage people to think about it. And, and while they are still around and can remember to kind of itemize things and explain what they are so that when the time comes, um, you're not left just guessing about, you know, a cassette that says demo on it um, and know a little bit more about it. And so, uh, you know, I, we're, we're, we're always, I'm always, sort of looking for people and talking to people and, and and you know when we give talks you know we give lectures or talks or do seminars online and things um 
encouraging people to think about their legacy and suggesting that you know we are the national repository for sound recordings and so we're the natural place for for this material and increasingly it is the unpublished material that we're interested in because it's things like demos and and, and works in progress and kind of live sessions and things like that or outtakes that um do kind of tell the whole story of the creative process that leads to the finished product that people know um but it's the it's the journey there that we can document through acquiring sound recordings like that and i have actually again just out of sight behind me uh, a large collection from uh, which we had just got in and we haven't announced yet i'm afraid um from a very influential <laughs> musician uh watch this space for that one mm. did you i mean did you was this something you always wanted to do or did you kind of fall into it ah, if i'd known you could do it um yes it would have been something i wanted to do but it, it is something i just fell into as, as one could at that time um mm. i was talking to a couple of colleagues earlier um and you know you can now do kind of postgraduate or, or courses in in archiving and librarianship and, and um, all sorts of things which would qualify you for this sort of thing but uh, to become a, a curator you need subject knowledge um, whereas I um, I had the subject knowledge from when I was a student and when I was younger just being a, an, an avid consumer um, and I just um, started work um, on a temporary contract um, processing incoming material and then uh, things developed and uh, they realized that there was a need for somebody to look over to look after the kind of popular music field and to, so I was lucky enough to, to, to get that and, and carry on with it um, so yeah I mean it, it's it, it's um, uh, it's been an interesting uh, number of years uh, working at it, uh, and and you know, like to to great extent uh, and enjoyable because uh, I'm still here. So thank you, Andy Lin, and for your expertise, for your time, and for your inspiration. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's always good to talk about the work we do, and uh, hopefully it will inspire people to take an interest in, in, in our, our work. Hello. Thank you, Andy. That's brilliant. Uh, good. Yes, well, I hope it was uh, informative. I mean, I've watched, I've probably watched it about three or four times now, and every time there's more, I kind of learn more. It's, uh, I still can't believe seven million items. <laughs> it is a lot, yes. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions. Are you happy for me to go ahead? Um, yeah, I hope I can answer them. Okay, so uh, there's a question here which says, what about lesser pop music, like the music composed for adverts, TV programmes, soundtracks, etc.? Does the British Library concern itself with those? Um, yes, we do. Um, an amount of it is, you know, it has been commercially released. Um, it's quite difficult to sort of um, get you know, the, the, the kind of um, recordings of individual programmes uh, from the sources. But it is something that we're aware of um, that um you know when the opportunities arise we will try and uh, talk to people about obtaining them and also uh, in the same sort of field we uh, library music uh, which is increasingly getting a kind of um, uh, a, a, a following these days we are um talking to a couple of the bigger music libraries about uh, uh making sure that we uh cover what they've been doing and, and we can um, you know, make the recordings available through to our facilities as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's because a lot of it is unreleased. It's quite a difficult area to cover. So um, we are working on that sort of thing. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Um, another question, as the medium for recording music changes and technolo technology advances, how do you keep track of it? Do you keep transferring your collections to new media? Um, we do to an extent. I mean, obviously the digital um, domain now is something that's with us, um, has been for a while, and that is the way things are going and so we are taking material off old carriers and making them uh, making digital files of the recordings uh, so that we can so that generations of the future can actually play them because we know that um, a lot of the uh, old carriers the, the uh, sorry the old the old players such as VHS, Betamax, um, Minidisc um, are not manufactured anymore so that's quite important for us to do that. We do take a kind of slightly um, cautious view though, uh, in that um, we do look at, if a new medium comes along, look at the likelihood of its longevity, whether it actually really gets taken up as um, either a professional or a consumer um, medium. And so we don't suddenly put all our eggs in one basket when we see a, a, a new um, uh, medium come out and there are there is an international um, organization of uh, sound and audio visual archives and we talk to each other about whether this new medium is something that we consider uh, uh, you know, for, for the long term and we agree standards uh, for that sort of thing so yeah, we're also always very aware that um, things are dynamic and things are changing. But then, funnily enough, um, just in the, as an aside to this, um, I, talk, I keep mentioning mini disc as something that appeared appeared to be the future and then disappeared uh, just this week. Uh, well, yesterday I was in the office and we got a, um, the week's new releases came in from Universal Music and there's a new album by uh, Sam Fender, um, which is been very well reviewed and it's in a number of formats including uh, a mini disc so um much like the vinyl revival the cassette revival it appears the mini disc revival has now started um so yeah that's sitting on my desk um, as of yesterday which is quite amused it amused me quite a lot actually it's, that's curiously pleasing. I was always very fond of mini discs. <laughs> uh, I'd, yeah, I'd be really intrigued to know how many Sam Fender fans have a mini disc player. Or play well, we'll have to go and buy one now. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we are always looking at uh, different formats and how we can play them and how uh, how long they're likely to last. Um, Jane asks, what is the best format for archiving music? At the moment, um, we use uh, WAV files, digital files. Um, that's where we, we are committed. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the previous formats, you know, uh, as long as they're kept in reasonable conditions and not kind of uh, thrown around too much, they're reasonably durable. Um, so, you know, vinyl, shellac um, can survive a long, long time. Um, but as I've said earlier, the, 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 the problem that's the challenge that people face is that they find a wax cylinder, how do they play it? And um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can play all formats and mm -hmm. Uh, but the future is digital. Right. Um, what are the more popular searches in your collection of popular music? I don't know. Um, our catalogue's available online, so I just don't get to see what people are searching for. Um, they, people tend to come to me when they can't find what they're searching for, and that's when it will kind of filter through our inquiry service who may be able to help people. And if they can't, then and it needs to come subject knowledge, then it will come through to me. Um, so it, it, it's quite hard to say, really. Um, I would think that, you know, I, I'd like to think that uh, people can generally find what they're looking for. Um, and uh, if they can't, then it should come through to me and we will be able to give an answer. 
uh, mm. some description. But as to what the most popular searches are, um, I think our reference service would be the best place to answer that. And, All right. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, do you meet famous artists when you're collecting their work? <laughs> um, I have met some famous, yes, sometimes. Um, but again, not as often as you'd think. Um, but it's nice when people um, do take a, a, a personal concern rather than doing it through kind of management or something like that. So, um, yes, it, it, it does happen. And uh, people are also, and, you know, we are, we quite often, we will invite people to come, uh, people who are maybe considering donating their collections. They will come in, they will have a look around the archive and I will show them, I will talk to them about how their legacy would sit in the library and that um, is something that is very useful in uh, getting people to understand uh, exactly what we do and so yes we do meet people and, and show them what we do so that they can fully understand what they might be donating to us. Great. Um, Audrey asks are the wax cylinders flammable like early film was? <laughs> Um, no, but they would melt. Uh, I think that's the, um, the major danger. Um, yeah, they, they, they don't spontaneously explode like some of the film. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a loft full of material from our old record label. Would you be interested in that? Um, do you ever refuse donations? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we do. Uh, well, I, uh, first, my first question would be, what's, what's your old record label? When did it operate? Um, well, that sort of thing. So but Im immediately I would say, I'm interested, tell me more um, about it. Uh, we do turn down donations. Um, a lot of the time, um, you know, quite often it, 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 it's, in, it, it's nice that people um, offer things to us and um, we've got a lot of recordings already. And so um, particularly uh, nowadays people are offering us collections of shell act discs, 78 RPM discs. And we, many, many cases we say, well, I'm afraid we've got most of these already. Mm. Um, so it's not worth our while taking, but we will always be interested in hearing just what they are. Um, right. So if somebody says, yeah, I used to have a record label, then I'd say, oh, great. Right. Tell me more. Right. Get in touch. Is <laughs> answer. Um, so just a couple more, if that's OK. We've just slightly gone over. Um, <laughs> Do you ever go out looking for more obscure singers and musicians to record like Harry Smith or Cecil Sharp did? Um, it's, uh, well, we do, um, as the, the archive does, particularly our um, world and traditional music um, section. They um, you know, help people who are on um, ethnomusicologists traveling around. Um, people who are making um, recordings of particular types of folk, particularly folk music. Um, it happens less with popular music because um, rights issues do tend to kick in. Um, anyone who's signed any kind of record deal, we can't just go and record them. But we do, um, every year we record at the WOMAD Festival, um, which is mainly world music, but um, a lot of popular music there as well. And we've been doing that for over 30 years. And there are times that we know that uh, people are performing and we'd say it'd be interesting if we could have a recording of that and they might say yes. And also we put, increasingly we're putting on uh, performances at the British Library and uh, we tend to record those when we can. So uh, I am very interested in it's not so much um, something we can go out and do because if you imagine just in London, any one night, how many gigs under normal circumstances are happening. So it would be very hard to be representative um, and then multiply that by every venue uh, up and down the country. It's quite impractical, but um, we do know, we quite often get offered collections that people have made at particular venues and we're interested in that sort of thing as well. Great. So the last question is, what is the best way to get into working in sound or music archives? <sighs> um, 
it helps if you have a uh, well it depends there are many jobs in sound and music archives uh, the sound engineers so sound engineering qualifications that's one of them cataloging so librarianship and cataloging um curators tends to be subject knowledge so um studying uh, classical music or particular aspects of popular music um and or just general archival um qualifications all of which are now far more um widespread um to you know, courses in those sort of things than there were when i first started um but there are not that many um libraries and archives that have sound and sound recordings in them so opportunities aren't necessarily going to kind of spring up immediately but um you know it, it's a really interesting aspect i think of um archives and libraries is uh, sound recording and if you think about how long print and text have been a, around and they are the kind of for many many years have been the preferred medium to research sound recording has only been around since like the late 19th century but there is so much material um that people can use to do their research and find things out but um more and more of it is still being uncovered and so i think hopefully there's plenty of opportunities for people to qualify and get to work in sound archives uh going way way into the future so uh, i hope that answered the question it sounds great it just sounds really positive and forward and yeah exciting um and there's a comment from jane who says thank you so much this is brilliant <laughs> okay good well glad you enjoyed it so um thank you andy for your generosity and expertise it's just absolutely fascinating and when when we um did talk originally it was a lot longer we had to edit it down which is a shame but there's just so much more to know um so just to let everyone know that i'll send an email out uh with um, a link to the website the british library website and um a short feedback form to be great if you could fill in um, and also to let you know that uh, this event is dedicated to my friend sarah um, and at the end there will be a, a short dedication um, following this so if you could hang around for that that would be lovely and meanwhile i'll say thank you andy and goodbye thank you it's been uh, it's been good fun thank you so it's my dedication now. twas down in albert square i never shall forget her eyes, they shone like diamonds, and the evening it was wet, wet, wet. Her hair hung down in curls, she was a charming rover. We rode all night in the pale moonlight, away down to Lamorna. Good night. <laughs>